President of the Center for Desert Archaeology, and he'll give a brief introduction, and then we'll get started with the talk. Actually, the only reason I want to stand up here is because of the fire here. So thank you all for coming out and uh, braving the chill night here in Tucson, uh, something that's a little out of, out of the ordinary. The, I just want to make a real short uh, background statement about the Center for Desert Archaeology and our preservation archaeology mission. I think I've mentioned in a previous uh, intro here that we got a really nice grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation and were able to hire that man standing in the back there, Andy Lorenzi, to be a full-time preservation uh, outreach coordinator for us. Uh, field representative is his formal title, but he's out there doing archaeological preservation on a full-time basis. And the latest news from the National Trust is that they have awarded us a, an $8,500 emergency stabilization grant. We've been working with the town of Springerville for the past seven or eight years now. They are the owners and they run uh, regular tours out to the site of Casa Malpais. And this is one of the challenges of preservation archaeology. The town was doing great stuff. They were offering great tours. The site had been uh, excavated and stabilized, but it takes a lot of annual input into a stabilized site to keep it up and even attractive or even vaguely resembling an archaeological site. Uh, and the town of Springerville had no resources to do that. So Doug has been uh, working with them in particular. We've gotten previous grants. But there were two, the final two rooms that had not been backfilled and stabilized were threatened by imminent collapse. So we've got this emergency stabilization dollars from the National Trust. So again, ongoing kinds of working with local communities, uh, doing this kind of preservation, uh, community-based archaeology across the Southwest. And this, that's just a latest piece of news. And I'll turn the things back over to Doug, and he'll introduce Mark. And thank you all for coming. I hope you really enjoy these get-togethers. Question back there? I'll be right there. Okay, um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, the way this uh, format works is um, our speaker is going to speak for about 20 minutes to half an hour, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. And we really hope the whole point of tonight is that we uh, encourage some decent dialogue and um, some good question, question and answers. Uh, we'd like to thank our hosts, Cafe, uh, Casa Pachinte. Um, they're just doing an outstanding job helping us run this cafe, and the wait staff is, is really busting, busting moves to, to get you all served. Um, this is a traditional Spanish restaurant, so so it's kind of considered rude to bring you your check before you ask for it. So when you're ready, um, go ahead and ask for your check so that we can sort of um, keep the keep the dollars and the plates moving. Um, and we're going to talk for about, uh, again, 30 minutes for the lecture. We'll have about 30 minutes of question and answer. And then we'll take a short 10-minute break to do some housekeeping. And then we'll reopen the floor to questions and answers after that. So if there are any other questions, um, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Elson, uh, Pr Principal Investigator at the Center for Desert Archaeology. Thank you. <laughs> Well, good evening. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I want to clarify that I work actually for Desert Archaeology. And uh, we are the for-profit arm of the Center for Desert Archaeology. So where to begin? Well, about 10 years ago, the Arizona Department of Transportation decided to widen a 27 kilometer stretch of highway running from Flagstaff, Arizona, north to the boundary of Wapaki National Monument. This road, which is US 89, eventually goes up to Page, Arizona, is 
considered to be one of the more dangerous roads in Arizona. Um, if you had driven it 10, 12 years ago, there were 176 white crosses along the road. Uh, sort of an interesting byline, these were all put up by a single individual um, <laughs> who would track uh, traffic accidents, fatalities, and make crosses out of PVC pipe and put them up. ADOT, of course, was not happy with this, so ADOT would take them down, he would come back and put them up. Uh, and at the time, there was a very popular bumper sticker in Flagstaff that read, Pray for me and mine, I drive Highway 89. So, the Department of Transportation put out an RFP, a request for a proposal, and Desert Archaeology bid on this project. Um, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with how contract archaeology or cultural resource management works, but it's essentially similar to how uh, construction or other fields work, that there is a request for proposal, various companies bid on it. Now, in contract archaeology, which is sort of a weird mix of academics and business, uh, budget is supposedly not considered in the bidding. Uh, they look at your research design, they look at your personnel, they look at your staff, they look at your methods and how you are going to recover the data before the highway is built. Now it's almost impossible to put a road anywhere up in northern Arizona without going through prehistoric sites. And along this stretch of Highway 89, of US 89, there were 40 prehistoric sites that could not be avoided. And so when Desert Archaeology got the contract in 1997, I and uh, several others from here moved up to Flagstaff for about a year, over two field seasons, 97 and 98, and excavated around 40 sites that were in the right of way, that were going to be harmed by the construction. In the process, we dug up about 70 houses, both pit houses and uh, masonry pueblos. We recovered about 100,000 artifacts. We excavated another 400 or so features that were not houses, but inside the right of way. This is an incredible database. This is uh, the largest project, single project that had occurred in the Flagstaff area. And it allowed us to look at some very interesting research questions. Um, and we were very interested, of course, in how the road runs right by Sunset Crater National Mountain. Uh, it's within six kilometers of the volcano itself, and every project site had volcanic ash or cinders on the surface of the site. And so Sunset Crater has been a focus of Flagstaff area archaeology since Flagstaff archaeology began in the 1920s and 1930s. Dr. Harold S. Colton, who founded the Museum of Northern Arizona, was the first archaeologist to realize that Sunset Crater erupted at some point during the prehistoric occupation of the Flagstaff area. And this came about from excavation of a pit house. These are pit houses or semi-subterranean structures. Basically, you dig a large pit that is ranges anywhere from, say, four to seven or eight meters long by four or five meters wide. You line it with posts. You then plaster it with mud and adobe uh, with an entrance and a smoke hole, and you live in it. And um, because uh, this pit house was sealed by 40 or 50 centimeters of cinders on top of it, this was the first indication that Sunset Crater erupted during the prehistoric occupation. That's true. Um, <laughs> Uh, the question asked was, when did this eruption occur? Um, Colton and his colleagues, John McGregor and Lynn Hargrave, uh, spent a lot of time debating when Sunset Crater erupted. It's a very important question because if you are living in the midst of a volcanic eruption, that is certainly going to alter your worldview, uh, probably change the way you live in terms of adapting to this event, 
it may cause severe stress. It may cause fatalities. Uh, it may cause neurosis, as the child indicated. Um, but and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and this is a good talk for children, though. Um, and so through tree ring dating, uh, they, Colton and others, were able to determine, or so they thought, Sunset Crater erupted in 1064 AD. Now that is a date that every school child in Arizona learns at some time, that uh, you will learn if you take Southwest Anthropology, Archaeology, and Universities. Uh, 1064 became firmly entrenched in the literature, and this was based on the work of geologist Tara Smiley, who, in the excavations of Wapaki, which is a hundred room pueblo up there, uh, he found three beams, three tree beams, that had narrow rings, that the rings were wide, and then 1064, 1065, the winter of 1064, the rings suddenly became narrow. Smiley said, well, this is perfect. This is, must be indicative of the volcano, and this date, has become set. Now we are questioning the date, and I, and I will get into that a little later. But the main question, <clears throat> excuse me, that we are asking is, how do humans adapt to catastrophic events? And this is, as you might expect, is a pretty relevant topic nowadays, given environmental change, uh, given what is occurring in the world with some of these huge disasters, Katrina. Uh, tsunamis, um, flooding in the, in the Midwest. And the question goes further, are there regularities in human behavior that we can use based on lessons from Sunset Crater or other catastrophes to help us plan and model how humans will react in the future? And through this project, I joined forces with a volcanologist from Northern Arizona University, Michael Ort, and a, a geomorphologist, also at NAU, uh, Kirk Anderson. And we became a team, essentially, to look at these, these aspects of volcanoes, or disasters in general. Now, Sunset Crater is a cinder cone eruption. It certainly erupted sometime between 1050 and maybe 1100, 1124 A.D. Smiley's date is in the ballpark. There's, there's no question about that. The way cinder cones erupt is they start as cracks in the earth. And we have a, a wonderful example of cinder cone eruptions based on the eruption of Pericutine Volcano in Michoacan, Mexico, that erupted for uh, nine years between 19, what is it, 1943 and 1952. Pericutine is probably the most well-researched volcano in the, in the northern hemisphere. There's no question about it. And it began in a cornfield. It was surrounded by small villages of Tarascan farmers, Tarascan Indian farmers, who now go by the Purapeche. And so by using that, we could start to model Sunset Crater. So, Sunset Crater erupted in an area that was very densely populated. It was in the Kana'a Valley. Uh, and this was a stream, and as you know, water sources in the southwest, extremely critical, uh, valuable. Uh, you can't live out here without water. Um, and so this was a densely settled area, and it began as a crack in the earth. And, we, and again, we know this from, from volcanology modeling. Um, and from this crack arose a curtain of fire. Okay, so lava shooting up sometimes 50, 100 meters into the air. You've got cinders coming up as well. Uh, there was a farmer who saw pericutine begin in his cornfield. And he describes it first as the ground sank about two meters, six feet a crack lengthened, and from this came out very weird stuff, he said, that set the bushes on fire. He said it was smoke, but it was not like any smoke he'd ever seen. While this eruption starts, it's accompanied by sounds, loud noises. It's been, the volcano eruptions have been described as from uh, Pompeii, from Etna, 
through the world as sounding like knocks and hisses and whistles and cracks from the center of the earth. A roar. We have documented evidence from modern volcanoes that they can sometimes be heard 300 to 400 kilometers away. Now, cinder cones, again, they are not strato volcanoes like where Mount St. Helens and uh, uh, these other large eruptions that, that we know. But you've got to think about that the prehistoric world was a very silent place. The loudest sound anybody had ever heard was a clap of thunder. And all of a sudden, not only do you have a crack in the earth which is emitting lava streaming up, ashes falling down that are setting the bushes on fire, it's loud and it's roaring and it's grumbling. Now this curtain of fire soon localizes to a single vent, which is Sunset Crater, where we see Sunset Crater now. Sunset Crater is just one volcano in the San Francisco volcanic field, which includes um, 600 cinder cones that have been erupting uh, for the past three or four million years. The field is still active. In fact, it's not a question of if the next volcano occurs, it's a question of when the next volcano is going to occur. It's my dream to see it. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, Sunset Crater occurred about a thousand years ago. The interval between eruptions is difficult to calculate, but we calculate it now as anywhere between 250,000 years down to 15 or so thousand years. I probably won't live that long. We don't know. I mean, stranger things have happened. However, Think about the prehistoric people living in the Sunset Crater area. All right, so you have this localization to a single vent that is spewing up cinders and ash. These things grow amazingly fast. Pericutine grew 300 meters high within six months. Within three days at Pericutine, the cone itself was over 100 feet high. So it's spewing these things, and then cinder cones, volcanoes, make their own weather system. And so as cinders and ash are coming up, you've got lightning and thunder coming down. In fact, at Pericutine, nobody was killed by the lava flow itself. Because these lava flows, they're not pyroclastic flows like we see at strato volcanoes, like Mount St. Helens, or uh, Mount Humphreys, the San Francisco Peaks, where the strato volcano that went off about three or four million years ago, you can outwalk the lava flows. If they're going downhill, you can outrun the lava flows. Um, <laughs> hopefully. However, what you do get are people killed by lightning strikes. At Pericutine, again, nobody was killed by the lava flow. Three people died from lightning. These are very God-driven features. It doesn't matter what religion you believe in or if you believe in one or not. However, when you experience a volcano, there is nothing like it. And I was fortunate enough to go to Kilauea at some point, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, and it's part of your handout there, uh, while the volcano was active, and to see this. And it, it, they are phenomenal. They really are. And in fact, you can go there as an atheist and come back believing in something. Uh, <laughs> Let, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> and so, what is going on in the minds of these people? How do they adapt to this event? The other thing that I like to think about is the fact that they're living surrounded by 600 cinder cones and all of a sudden another one pops up. This is a real aha experience. Oh, that's what they are. Um, you've got to, you know, understand that, th that this is, is a life-changing event. Now, Sunset Crater, the Flagstaff area, the Sanawa who lived in this area, up to the time of the volcano, lived in very small sites. Anywhere from four or five people, maybe, a household or two, up to 
maybe 10 households, 30, 40, 50 people. But after the volcano come the sites that you're used to in the Flagstaff area, like Wapatki, El and Pueblo, with, with 100 rooms or so. But before that, most of the decision making was at the household level, or probably at a slightly larger, higher level of maybe several households. But you knew everybody. What that allows you to do is to react fairly quickly to volcanoes, to catastrophes. These people made a decision. You've got lava coming, you have got an angry god roaring. There's no question about it that there is something going on. It's heading towards you. You pack up and move. It's that simple. And then you can move to areas where your kin are living. And yes, it, Sunset Crater, there's no question that it destroyed houses, destroyed agricultural food fields, it destroyed food resources, it altered drainages, it, some springs remained open, others closed, new springs came up. Again, water is very critical. But they did not live in a nested hierarchy like we do. Now there was a volcano that erupted in 1985 in Colombia called Ruiz. 30,000 people died from this eruption. They died because neither the church nor the state was willing to make a decision to tell these people to move. Why? Well, if they told everybody to move and to leave and nothing happened, they would essentially be out of jobs. So as a result, the volcano itself melted ice fields, tops of the mountains, and caused huge lahars. Lahars are mud flows that go very, very fast, hundreds of miles an hour. And it killed 30,000 people. Communication is very key in disasters. I had, this summer, uh, I was invited to attend the Natural Hazard Center workshop on catastrophes. And it was, it was fascinating going to this as an anthropologist because what was occurring there, listening to these, was how poorly adapted we are as a culture, as a society, to deal with catastrophe. At Katrina, the major problem, and there were a lot of Katrina people at, at these meetings. There were 400 people there. Um, in fact, these meetings started about 20 years ago with 30 people. And they had a tradition that everybody stands up and gives their name and talks about their work for a minute. You know, I'd try this with 400 people. Uh, <laughs> it was insane, but it got through in about two hours. Um, but what happened at Katrina? Communication was dead for the first four days. Nobody knew what to do, and there was no authorization. There were no lower levels of organization where people had the authority to make decisions. And rumors and media started almost immediately. I think we've all heard how they were shooting at helicopters. Um, now, I talked to first responders at these meetings who were in the helicopter crew, and they said, well, you know, we heard this, and we said, those ungrateful SOBs, we're coming in to help these people to rescue them. They're shooting at us. We're not going in. And they didn't. This is what happened. So the media got out of control. Communication was dead. There were absolutely no accounts of anybody shooting at a helicopter. None. It's also interesting the words that are used for this. When the police would break into a store to get goods and supplies, it was appropriation. When the people would break into stores to get the same goods, what was it? It was looting. That's exactly what it was. And people died because they did not have authority, did not know what to do. Now, Katrina, of course, is a large scale compared to Sunset Crater. But there are, I believe, lessons from Sunset Crater that can be applied. 
All right, so sometime between 1050 and 1100, you have this volcano going off. It's altering people's worldview. This is the most awesome, amazing thing they had ever experienced. Did they have it in their recent memory? No. Nobody alive had dealt with a volcano. Now they did have, I'm sure, traditional histories going back about volcanoes. I think volcanoes are very much a part of human knowledge. Um, they have been occurring, of course, for millions of years as we have been human. And there is something that is. It's very fascinating about these. Why? why? We, we are. We, we are just extremely fascinated. And I think there may be some deep primordial memory in there. I don't know. I mean, I can't certainly prove it, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's possible. And so Sunset Crater, not only did it throw out lava flows, which covered about eight square kilometers, it threw out an ash and cinder blanket anywhere from about 12 meters deep, right by the cinder cone itself, down to a couple inches, five to 10 centimeters, out by Wapaki or so, 20 kilometers away. The ash is actually more destructive than the lava flows. And what our research showed us, and this is something that Colton had, had picked up on before, we made experimental agricultural plots in various elevations, because the project area ran in elevation from about 5,000 to about 7,500 feet. And we covered it with no cinders, with one inch, three inches, and six inches of cinders. I, and I had a, a botanist working with us, actually. Planted corn, planted Hopi corn, to see what would happen. No crop arose by Wapatki in areas without cinders. And nobody from Colton to uh, several other researchers has ever been able to grow corn without a cinder cover by Wapaki. Wapaki gets six inches of rain a year. That is way below the threshold for corn agriculture. Corn itself needs anywhere from about 10 to 15 inches, half of which must fall during the growing season. It's always been a mystery as to why these people could live out there and build these, these big pueblos. Well, what happens is that the cinders serve as a mulch. And this has been well studied in pebble mulch fields because the Anasazi by uh, Albuquerque, the Rio Grande, would put pebbles across their fields. And so in this case, the cinders, between one to three inches, increased crop productivity. Now we put plots at Wapaki, and then we put a plot by Sunset Crater, which is right at about, Sunset Crater itself is about 7,000 feet. We put one at 6,000, and then we put one at M&A at the Museum of Northern Arizona, which is at 7,200 feet. We used the M&A plot as our control, and we watered that plot. The other two plots we didn't water. And again, Wapatki, no corn germination without a cinder cover. At our site at 7,000, 6,000 feet at Lenox Park, we did get some germination without cinders because it's wetter up there, the higher you go, it's wetter, but we had no fruit, no maturity. And again, areas from one to three inches uh, germinated at a much higher frequency. The other thing that our experiment showed us, and this is something that Colton did not pick up on, is that with more than six inches of cinders, you get no crop. The cinders are too deep for the corn to come up. And so once we realize this through our experiments and we looked at a map, and this is map number two, or the second page of your handout, which is called an isopack map, which is a map of cinder thickness. When we looked at that map, we saw that over 400 square kilometers was under two deep cinders to have corn or anything. So under 30 centimeters. I, th I think that the map is in centimeters. I can't remember. We've, we've done some in inches, some in centimeters. Um, so you get no, no germination. Basically, people who lived there became volcano refugees. They had to leave the area. Where did they move? Well, again, 
if you look at the areas with one to three centimeters or one to three inches of cinders, such as Wapaki, it now opened up a huge area for agriculture that had been previously closed. Now through the years, Colton and others, Chris Downham, several other people, have said that the eruption acted as a population magnet. Colton called it a prehistoric land rush. As people from outside poured into the Flagstaff area to take advantage of the cinder mulch. Well, we think that enough people became volcano refugees based on areas with greater than 30 centimeters of cinders that you don't need to pull in large numbers of people to account for the population. But where did the people come from if they were coming in? Now, if you look at your first map in the packet, this is a view show. Oh, sorry. This. Yes, okay. The one that, yes, the one that has got the southwest with the blue and the red. Basically, uh, using digital elevational modeling, so looking at heights of features, knowing, because volcanology can model how high the fire fountain was and how high the ash plume was based on the dispersion of cinders. There are formulas for this from modern work. That volcano, the ash plume, was visible in Tucson. Not from where we're standing, but if you climb the top of Mount Wrightson or top of Mount Lemon, you would have seen a very black cloud that wasn't moving. Now, people, of course, were very much more in tune with the environment than we are today. They would have known something odd, something very unusual was going on. From Phoenix itself, not even up on top of the mountains, you would have seen the ash plume. From Chaco Canyon, you would have seen the ash plume. From Durango, Colorado, from Palm Springs, California, you would have seen the ash plume. Now the fire fountain, which would have been spectacular, particularly at night because it reflects off the cloud so it actually goes a much greater area than we've shown you there in red would have been visible from the White Mountains from the Bradshaw Mountains which are only 70 kilometers north of Phoenix from parts of the Grand Canyon the higher parts um, but people in the southwest everybody would have known something very, very unusual was occurring, and something that was likely God-driven. So, did people flock there to look at this, or did people stay away? We, we don't know. I mean, we do know that the population and the area abandoned by these volcano refugees is very close to the area that was resettled. There probably were people coming in from the outside to look at this. I think, though, for too long, we have sort of looked at the Southwest and, and, and the prehistoric group there as being very isolated. People didn't talk. People didn't move. And I think that's not true. And, and as more research has shown us, when the Spanish came into Mexico, they met Indians in Mazatlan and areas south who could draw the floor plan of Zuni. They had been to Zuni. So there's a lot of, of this movement going on. What happens when your God causes this huge catastrophe? Now at Pericutine, the eruption was blamed on the desecration of a shrine. There was a white cross put up on the hillside. And there were two competing factions in town. And three years before the eruption, one of the factions put up this white cross, which within weeks was torn down. This is why the volcano erupted. God was angry. There was a plague of locusts a year before the eruption. This was a sign the eruption was occurring. Every time we see volcanoes, they are accompanied by some sort of ritual behavior. At Paracutine, the women in the town made a procession on their knees across the plaza to the church. Now this church, Pericutine caused the abandonment of five towns, about a thousand people. This church happened to have a very famous Santos in one of the areas of the church. And they 
women made a procession to stop the lava. It, it didn't work. They then erected a row, a wall of six foot high white crosses at the town edge as the lava came down. Didn't work, pushed it over. They finally took the Santos and made a procession and carried it 30 kilometers or so to the new village where the Mexican government was resettling them in the new church. But you know, the lava filled much of the church. And this is, these are some very famous photos. If you go on the internet and, and Google Pericutine, you'll see photos of this church with just the tower sticking up, except for the area where the saint was. This wasn't covered by lava. This was a miracle. We're very interested in looking at these ethnographic events. How do people react? How long does it take for events like this to make their way into mythology? And when we got uh, grant funding from the National Science Foundation and the Park Service to go down to Pericutine and to start exploring this. Um, and I, the church where the Santos now resides, which is the, is the largest town there, is, is fascinating. I mean, it has beautiful murals of the eruption, but outside it has got a huge diorama. And if you put in five centavos, there is the devil. There is no question that he's the devil with a tail and horns with bellows. And he is flaming pericutine, where two people have the Santos and they're on tracks and they go from the old town to the new town carrying this. Now that's a connection with the past, but what that also shows is how quickly Pericutine erupted 50, 60 years ago. This has moved its way into mythology, into traditional history. And when you talk to the people down there, they tell you that the time before the eruption was idyllic. Butterflies flew, birds chirped, music was everywhere. But since the eruption, life is not good. And these people were forced to resettle by the Mexican government. And as I told you, nobody died from the volcano itself. A hundred people died from land wars that broke out after the eruption because the volcano covered not only traditional territorial boundaries, but the Mexican government was resettling people into towns that were already inhabited. Land wars were the prime factor, along with loss of the will to live, and particularly by the very elderly. Being forced out of their homes, they essentially just died. Now, there's been a lot of research on catastrophes and what augments catastrophes, what makes them significant. And of course, one is, sure, human mortality. However, it is not just human mortality, it is being close, proximal, to people who are dead or injured. If it happens at night, if a disaster happens at night, the impact is much, much stronger than if it occurred during the day. And think about it. You're surrounded by blackness. And you are surrounded by this thing that is emitting light or floods or whatever, and you can't see. The impact is extremely high. And this is where we do see post-traumatic stress syndrome occurring in people. So the people from Sunset Crater moved down into the Wapaki area where they learned to manage the cinders. And there's, we see all sorts of rock alignments and rows of rock there that never made any sense as water traps because they're running uh, perpendicular to the slope. And what we think they are is cinder management. You've got to keep a consistent one to three inch layer of cinders over your fields. Now the Wapaki area was abandoned within 100 years. The earliest tree rings we have there, about 1125. AD, the last about 1250. This may have been the limit to which people could manage cinders enough to grow a crop. I mean, you know, again, and, and I have to say, what I'm telling you is not entirely accepted uh, by the archaeologists in the Southwest. Uh, I have been called a flatlander <laughs> because I came from the flatlands and went up to the highlands. Um, but it is controversial. Now let's talk a little about ritual and then we'll open up for questions. 
studies of modern catastrophes have found that religion and ritual are extremely important in ad adaptation. People who are believers of some sort cope much more easily than people who are not because they are more accepting of the disaster that occurred for whatever reason. Maybe because they feel that they know what the cause was. Maybe it was because the shrine was desecrated. But we do see with disasters worldwide, and again, in talking to uh, people at the uh, National Hazards Workshop, uh, particularly people from faith-based organizations, it is clear that churches and synagogues and uh, other things played a key role in Katrina recovery. They became an organizational focal point. They started to make decisions about how to deal with the people that the government and the state weren't going to make because communication was down. So religion is extremely important adaptation. And Pericutine, again, the people who lived there who were following the old Peripeche traditions adapted much better. Now, Sunset Crater, we have never seen any indication of ritual associated with the volcano. And the question, I think, is why don't we? We should. It should be expected, and not seeing it should be an aberration. But it's very interesting that there are no known rock art drawings of Sunset Crater. We have drawings of the San Francisco peaks and kivas. We have drawings of lots of physiographic features. We have nothing on Sunset Crater. Why is this? I don't know. Is it taboo to draw a picture? Have we not found it? Is it something so powerful that we can't capture it? But it is very interesting. Now, in the course of our investigations, we were working a site. And this guy came along and he said, you know, there's a, a site just about a half mile up the road where the lava overran a cornfield. And we looked at this guy and we said, what? He said, yeah, there's a site and the lava overran the cornfield. Well, where he was telling us we knew was at least four or five kilometers away from the nearest lava flow. So we kind of rudely, <laughs> Uh, sorry to say, I've since apologized. Um, <laughs> brushed this guy off, but it was intriguing enough that we said, well, maybe we should go out and take a look. So we went and we climbed the cinder cone. And this cinder cone is a Tappan age cinder cone. Tappan period is about 250 to 75,000 years ago. 250,000 years to 75,000. And we got up to the top of the site, and yeah, there was a masonry structure, a little one, and there were some pit house depressions. And we're poking around the masonry structure, and all of a sudden we pull out this picture in your handout that shows a piece of sunset crater lava with impressions of corn cobs, prehistoric corn cobs. Now I have a piece in my pocket, <laughs> and you can't see it. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I have a five-year-old, so. <clears throat> um, it's not the same piece in the photo. The piece in the photo is exquisite, but uh, it is a piece of sunset crater lava with corn cob impressions that I'm going to pass around. It's uh, a, a different piece, but look at it, feel it, touch it. Now, what happened? How do you get corn cob impressions in hot lava? Doesn't the corn burn before it makes impressions? So this is actually the point where I started to look at this with volcanologists, trying to figure out how this was made. And in fact, that piece that's in your handout was a, in a wall of a structure. It was purposely placed in that wall of the structure. Now, the site was outside of the right of way. This was a little problem. Um, however, I did bring a crew up on a weekend and we gridded the site into 25 by 25 square meter units and we surface collected the site using the methods and what we found was there was an area of the site that was covered with debris of sunset crater basalt. The sunset crater basalt is black. The underlying tappanage basalt is red. It was very clear that it had been brought in. 
We eventually did convince ADOT that this was fairly significant. And in fact, there had been a piece of, we call them corn rocks, in the uh, Sunset Crater Visitor Center. So they had been known, just nobody knew where they came from or what they were doing. We eventually recovered about 100 pounds of Sunset Crater basalt from the surface of the site. Not, we didn't dig. I mean, that, that <laughs> no, that wouldn't have worked. Um, <laughs> But from the surface, and particularly from an area that was about eight meters by eight meters, about 64 square meters, covered with this basalt that had clearly been broken, had been worked, had been broken apart to get at something. And so we thought about all these different theories. How could this happen? Could it have been lava accidentally overrunning a cornfield? And then people bringing this up for whatever reason, bringing 100 pounds of stuff up in baskets. That's a lot of dump loads. And the site was five kilometers removed from the nearest lava flow. And so we went to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> and you can see the picture on the very last page of your handout, uh, which, which I took, is volcanologist Wendell Duffield, who was working with us along with Michael Ort, putting corn into the Kilauea lava flow. Now, I brought Hopi corn with me. I ran out of that fairly quickly, so I got Safeway frozen corn. Uh, but that's a good approximation. <laughs> yeah, I've been getting crap for that for a while. Um, <laughs> but we put the corn in the lava. And you can see from the picture, particularly the second one that's a close-up, that we were not getting the exquisite detail of the corn rocks at all. We were just getting these depressions. Well, this led us to believe that it wasn't lava overrunning a cornfield. Now, when you ask about how can you get impressions without the lava burning the feature up, when you go to Kilauea, Hawaii, there are whole forests of basically volcano plugs where trees had been that are up the side and then the tree burns up but you have this impression. There are also impressions in the lava flow of pandamus fruit which is a, just a type of bumpy fruit but it's very clear. What happens when lava hits a feature, the feature if it has water in it quenches the lava enough for a cast to be formed. Now, in some ways, this is fortunate because volcanologists who have plunged into lava through skylights with their leg, yes, I mean, no doubt about it, they're hurt. But because the skin is moist, it allows the lava to at least not burn you as severely as you would, would think. Um, now, lava itself has to be, for it to flow, the flux point where basalt rock becomes molten is about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, we're talking hot stuff. Um, but at the toe of the flow, the lava was too cold for us to make corn impressions. I do have to say we confused a lot of Japanese tourists. Because um, <laughs> you could smell the corn roasting. And I looked up. I mean, we're by the, the ocean. I looked up and they're like, um, it, was, it was very interesting. We actually became an official mission of the Hawaii uh, HVO, Hawaii Volcanology Observatory. Uh, so we had volcanologists with us from there as well. You can also see from the top one where, where uh, Duff is putting Safeway corn. That is, that is a piece of Safeway corn. And the plastic. It, putting it in, no, no, I took the plastic off. Um, <laughs> but putting it into the lava, you can see the ocean is right behind us. Well, what happens when lava hits water? You get what's called a phreatomagmatic explosion. But we're so intent down there, you know, trying to make this right, that what we did is we took a class of uh, NIU graduate students to Hawaii. And I mean, they had scheduled anyway, so we kind of tagged along. I have to say that the Department of Transportation did not authorize or pay for this trip. Um, but when lava hits water, you get a fatal magmatic explosion. And so we would be down there, and I was going to hear, run! And we would <laughs> charge back up the slope a little bit before it exploded. 
When we had an ethnobotanist, Charlie Mixichek, look at, we made latex casts of the corn in the corn rot. And Charlie identified three different types of corn. There was a popcorn, there was a flower corn, and then there was a sweet corn or an edible corn. Uh, based on the rows and, and, and the characteristics. Now that became even more interesting because we, and the corn rocks, not only they have corn, they have husk impressions, but very few husk impressions, mostly corn. However, the Sanawa and, and the Indians, prehistoric who lived there, were very aware of cross-pollination. They did not grow different types of corn right next to each other to avoid this. So, we have a rock, basalt, that's got three different types of corn. How do we explain that? As we kept thinking about this and doing this, it became very clear to us, and again, this, this is controversial, it became clear to us that these were deliberately made, that these were not accidents, that nobody saw the corn coming over a pile. And in fact, I tried. I mean, I, I put corn into highly molten lava, covered up and gone, and never saw it again. So, given the fact that we've got three different types of corn, given the fact that the corn, most of it is husked, we think that these were deliberately made. And what we think is that they were made around a volcanic feature called a spatter cone, or an ornito. Now these are little, if you ever see a volcano again, they're little, anywhere from 2 to 10 meters high, 6 to 30 feet, which emit very, very hot, very fluid lava blooping out, basically. That's a volcanology word, blooping. Um, and what we think happened was that they put the corn around the ornito as some sort of offering. The corn got covered and was able, to, because it was so fluid, to make these detailed impressions during a quiescent period, which happens a lot with ornitos. They were able to go back and remove it, and remove 100 pounds of this, carry it again, five kilometers and up a very steep hill at the top of the cinder cone where they then broke it apart and got the corn casts, one of which we know was put in the wall of the structure. This to us appears to be deliberate ritual or religious behavior, ceremonial of some sort. Um, can I prove it? No. Um, however, I think that we have made a very plausible argument. And I have to say, there is one archaeologist in Flagstaff in particular, Chris Downham, who is very much against this. Very much. I'm not sure why. It pushes his buttons. Um, but he's not. And now we have had these the rocks chemically analyzed through several different methods. They are clearly sunset crater basalt. The signature of the corn rock matches the signatures of the cinders. So, was religion being used to help these people adapt? I would say yes. I would say that it probably was a very important part of the eruption. Now, I just want to close briefly to talk about that photograph on the bottom of the corn rock. You've got the corn rock on page two, and underneath that there's a photograph of a piece of ceramic, a sherd, in a piece of lava. Now what happened was this, that an archaeologist for the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, John Heron, had heard about our work and you know, looking at volcanoes and things like that. And he had remembered that, you know, he had some pieces of things with, with, with shards stuck in them that had been collected 10 years prior. And had been collected from a site and that's the only place they were found, and the site was named the Lightning Site because the archaeologists who collected these believed that lightning had struck this rock and it caused the shards to fuse in it. Well, we also knew that there was a volcano that had very recently been dated by a University of Utah geologist, Cassandra Fenton, to have gone off any time between A.D., or actually 300 BC and 1500 AD through cosmogenic helium dating, which as you can see has a very precise date. Um, however, this did put it in the realm of human occupation. We were intrigued. 
And so John showed us the, you know, he sent us photographs. And so we went up there, Michael Ort, uh, my team, myself, Kirk Anderson, to look at this. And we got some grant funding from Western National Parks Association and went up there. And sure enough, at this site, there were sherds embedded in lava. And the sherds are diagnostic. They are a type called hurricane black on gray, which if you know Southwest pottery is an analog to black mesa black on white. These came from the north rim of the Grand Canyon by Toro Weep. So the, uh, right at the base of a, a mountain called Mount Trumbull. Um, black mesa black on white is very well dated to sometime between about 1000 and 1100 AD. So what do we have? We now have two volcanoes erupting at about the same time. Is this good juju? No. This is not good juju. Also, from our viewshed analysis, we could see that Sunset Crater was clearly visible from Little Springs. This is called Little Springs Volcano. It's been known for quite a while, it just hadn't been dated. And when we went up there and surveyed it, the lava is fresh as at Sunset Crater. It looks very similar. Do we have another instance of ritual behavior of people putting sherds around an ornito, maybe a whole pot? And then again, this site was located about a kilometer away from the nearest lava flow. Bringing this to a site and embedding it in the wall of a structure. All the shirt rocks, and we have about eight to 10 of them, were found in wall rocks in a single structure. We haven't dug the site. We are actually attempting to get funding to do that, because I think it'd be very interesting. But think about then the ramifications for the Southwest. You have Sunset Crater going off between 1050 and 1100. We actually think that the 1080s based on a whole lot of evidence I'm not going to go into here. But between 1050 and 1100, then we have little springs that at least the ceramics are dating it between 950 and 1100. The architecture at the site itself suggests 1000 to 1100. Little Springs was a much different eruption than Sunset. It didn't have a big cinder fall. Probably did have a fire fountain and a plume, but it was not of the same magnitude. In fact, only six square kilometers were covered by lava flow or bombs, bombs big enough to hurt you. Um, so it was, it was very different. And the interesting thing about adaptation is that the Sunset Crater lava flow was never reoccupied. I mean, you go up there today and you can see why. It's jagged, it's hard, it's uh, almost impossible to walk on. And it's also big. And so people, because of the ash around it, couldn't live anywhere within 15 to 20 kilometers. Little Springs, however, there was no cinder blanket. The lava only covered six square kilometers. And when we went up on top to survey, we found at least 150 structures at about 10 sites up on top of the flow. Not only did we find structures, we found trails through the lava smooth enough to run on. And that takes a lot of work to build. These people were bridging crevasses. They were taking lava blocks and putting in there. The interesting thing about the trails is they're not visible from the ground surface. They're access points are not visible at all. You have to be up on top to see these. We found a total in these 150 structures, two artifacts, two sherds. This, and at the edge of the flow, you also had structures and sites with larger artifact assemblages. Again, this suggests that lava or the lava flow were being used as a defensive retreat of some sort. Um, and we have some very interesting modern data from Lake Thule in California. Um, I, I forget the name of the tribe there, but uh, the US Army estimated that they would need 2,000 people, MODOC, the MODOC Indian Wars, the US Army estimated they would need 2,000 soldiers to rouse the 250 MODOC living in the lava field there. Um, so, there also are uh, records that uh, one of the, uh, the massacres that occurred in historic times up there, the bandits went into the Little Springs lava 
to hide out. It's a very good hideout place. So we've got a different example of how people are using and adapting to the situation. So I think I'll stop there. I think I probably have said too much, Bill. Um, <laughs> and I think the schedules will take a little break. And then we'll have questions and we can talk further about adaptation. You know, how do people adapt to catastrophic events? Are there lessons from Sunset Crater that can be applied to Katrina or Katrina-like situations? Thank you.